Good to see everybody this morning. Still alive. Everybody's still alive. All right, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer and we'll get started. And uh, Father, thank you this morning for Jesus. Lord, thank you for the word of God. Lord, I, I pray, Lord, that you might uh, bless this lesson. And Lord, uh, I pray that you'd help each one of us to listen. Lord, uh, just to learn from your word this morning. Help me to tell the truth. Lord, as we seek your face this morning, pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, uh, turn to Isaiah chapter 1. Uh, and then also 2 Timothy chapter 3. Isaiah 1. And then 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, and then we'll go back to Isaiah. But I wanted to show you a comparison, really, uh, as we study into this lesson, uh, like I did last week, and we see this, because I want you to see a comparison of what's going on in our world today, as well as what went on back there. And I, I thought it's kind of interesting as I thought about this, because we're going to see this in just a minute. Uh, of the comparison. Notice what it says, verse 1. Most of us know this. You could probably quote it. Uh, verse 1, it says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Okay, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetousness, covet, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, Truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, 
despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Now watch this verse right here. Verse 5 says, having a form of what? A form. Okay, it's just a form. In other words, uh, they're playing the game. All right? But denying the power thereof, and the Bible says, from such turn away. Now back to Isaiah chapter uh, 1. Just remember what we've read because I want you to see this uh, in a comparison as we look at this this morning. Verse 1, chapter 1. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning, here it is, Judah and Jerusalem, two southern tribes. We talked about it last week. Okay, in the days of, notice the names, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah, southern tribes. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. In other words, all the way across the world. Uh, For the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. All the way back from the time when they were let go out of Egypt, and they went across the Red Sea, we see that, in other words, they got into the wilderness, they still hadn't learned very much. We don't have time this morning, but if you'll go back sometime and read Exodus uh, 1, all the way up to about chapter 6 or so, give or take, you're going to see exactly what took place because God had just delivered them out of, uh, out of Egypt for uh, 430 years worth of bondage. But as what we see, again, is they get over there and the first thing that what happens is they start murmuring and complaining. And they murmured so much that God said, okay, uh, this is what's going to take place. And so they started dying off one by one. Just imagine now when you, when you think about it. When they left out of there, from uh, uh, God had told them from uh, the age of about 20 on uh, down would live, but the rest would die. And so when you start adding up, you're, you're talking about in excess of 1.5 million people. In a matter of time, I mean, you think about that, that, that God fed all those people. There was about 2.5, give or take, uh, their total and about one's going to, you know, come out alive. They're going to have an army of 650,000. That's what the Bible says. Uh, so when they came out, there was a standing army of 650,000. And so you, you think about that. Now, God watched over them. He nourished them just like little children. He led them along. And along came Joshua uh, 40 years later because he had obeyed God. And, and guess what? He went into the land uh, uh, along with Caleb. But then, notice what it says, verse 2 here. It says, I have nursed you and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. In other words, the rebellion. Kind of just like what we just read over in 2 Timothy. In other words, just rebellion, people uh, playing. Now notice what it says, verse 4. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers. In other words, all the way back, he said a seed. So you're talking about... All, all these people, uh, again, of children that are corruptors. We just read about children that didn't obey their parents over there in Second Timothy. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel. And again, that particular uh, title of, of God, as we'll see in just a minute, you're going to see it 25 times in the book of Isaiah. Okay? Uh, They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backwards. And so, uh, and again, verse 6, From the sole of the feet even to the head, there is no soundness in it but wounds. Okay? So we'll kind of stop there. So you kind of see the the, uh, comparison of what took place back then and what's going on now and what's going on in in the world today. In other words, nothing has changed. They, they knew about God, like I said last week, but they did not obey God. And so consequently, we're going to see devastation. God is, uh, by the time this uh, we're going to talk about today, you're going to see what takes place. Because in Isaiah's day, there is a veneer, in other words, just a shell, just uh, something out there showing of external religion. But uh, guess what? 
It was only skin deep. In other words, that they knew all about it. They had seen the miracles, the signs, that all the way through the, the wilderness and all the things that God had performed. Uh, again, we, we find that Judah and, uh, and Jerusalem there, the two southern tribes, is what had taken place. They, they had uh, gone past uh, from the time that the kingdom split, we said in 930 uh, last week uh, when it split, up until now, uh, you're going to see it's about 345 years, okay? And then the, the 10 northern tribes, we said last week, it was, about, uh, two, uh, it was about 220 years, give or take, okay? And so they knew all about it. They had watched uh, the 10 northern tribes sink and be completely almost annihilated and, and spread out all over the earth. And so he's telling them, he said, you need to wake up, look at what just took place, and now it's fixing to happen to you. And they didn't want to listen, as, we, as you see, as we progress in this book. And I wanted to uh, uh, talk about that a little bit. In other words, you see a large percentage of the people profess faith in Jesus. Now think about what's going on today. A whole lot of people profess faith in Jesus Christ, but very few of them are really saved. And I, and, I, and I found it astounding, uh, uh, read about Billy Graham. And uh, Billy Graham preached to millions of people. And supposedly about 1.5 million people made professions of faith in his day through all his campaigns and everything like that. But Billy Graham made a statement. Somebody asked him one time, he says, how many people do you actually think out of all these professions that have been made, how many do you think uh, are saved? He said, less than 10%. And so you think about all the churches is out there. We've got uh, people preaching the gospel or whatever, people making professions, but there's very few changes in life. You wonder, are they saved? And see, this is what God is saying. These, there's a veneer. In other words, there's religion out there. You know, it's kind of like when people get into a crisis, they want to turn to God. Remember back in 9-11, uh, how everybody just kind of stopped what they was doing? Man, they were filling stadiums. They were going into the churches. They were filling everything. God bless them. You know, and all this stuff's happening. We all thought, you know, this is, man, this is terrible stuff uh, taking place right on our soil. Well, within two weeks and everything's uh, back good, and guess what? You can't find them with a flashlight in a bathtub. And, and I guarantee you, you know, when you look at it, it's even uh, every time there's a crisis, uh, it was the uh, same thing going on. And so uh, this is happening right here. Now, here's the thing about this right here is they profess faith, yet they brazenly break God's law. And the Jesus they worship is an idol of their own imagination. Now think about that. That's what we're going to read about some more of that in just a minute when we start talking about those four kings I put on your paper there uh, when we get into that. Again, it's a God of their own imagination. Now this is what takes place today is when you uh, go out talking to people and pass out tracts and things like that, uh, uh, guess what happens is people say, oh, you know, I'm, I don't need that, you know, and this and this, and that, or I got my own, I do my own thing. In other words, they made a God in their own imagination of what they think that a God should be like. In other words, he's this hip, you know, rock and roll dude out there somewhere that's, you know, up, up in the sky somewhere, you know, the big man in the sky, kind of like when they're, you know, talking on TV and stuff like that. In other words, it's just a shell, a veneer of religion. And that's exactly what's going on in our worlds today when you talk to people. And so, again... Uh, partway through Isaiah's ministry, the northern tribes were carried away captive. We talked all about that uh, last week. I won't try to go back in that by 722, 723 B.C. Now, again, uh, there's three prophets, again, during Isaiah's day. you got Hosea, Micah, and Nahum, which are kind of contemporary along with him. Those are smaller books, uh, you know, back there. Uh, as uh, in the Old uh, Testament there. Now, the major events that occurred during Isaiah's ministry are associated with the lives of these kings. In other words, look at verse 1 again. 
it says the vision. You say, what's a vision? In other words, it's called a vision. In other words, which suggests that the prophecy saw, that they saw, he saw mentally. In other words, and spiritually as well as heard what God had communicated with him. So in other words, he, he sees it. It's kind of like John on the Isle of Patmos in the book of Revelation. When he saw, he said, uh, uh, of what took place. Now, he says, The vision of Isaiah the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, the two southern tribes, in the days of Uzziah. Now, let's talk about Uzziah. He was about the eighth or ninth king. Remember I said last week there was about 20 kings uh, for the southern tribes. Only eight of them were good. Uh, the northern ten tribes had 19 kings. Not nary one of them was good. And there were some of them that was even worse than some of the other ones that were wicked. They were just far more wicked than the rest of them. But Uzziah w was a, a pretty good king uh, when, it, when it came to that. In other words, he's also called Azariah. So if you're reading along, uh, and he served guess, uh, about 52 years. And so he was the second uh, out of all the kings uh, that served when, when, you, when he served. Manasseh, uh, down the line, his great-grandson, you're going to see, served 55 years. But he was a wicked man, far above uh, even some of the kings of, of the southern tribe. And again... Now, uh, Uzziah, uh, hold your place and put your ribbon there in Isaiah and turn back to Second Chronicles chapter 26 and kind of put your paper there in Second Chronicles chapter 26 because we'll be looking at it, chapter 27 and 28 this morning as we look at some of these kings. So just kind of put your uh, ribbon there in Isaiah and then uh, go back to Second Chronicles. Uh, again, it's... Uh, when you look at these books, First and Second Samuel, First and Second King, First and Second Chronicles, again is all one book in the Jewish Old Testament, and uh, and so they, when you look in their Bible, these are all combined here. They they split them up uh, in our in uh, in our Bibles today. Now, Second Chronicles twenty six. Is anybody is everybody there? Is there anybody uh, need a lesson? Okay. Uh, You're welcome. Everybody good? Okay. Got one? You got yours? Okay. You're welcome. You got one there? Mm -hmm. All right. Now notice that first one there, Uzziah. Pretty good king. Let's look in chapter 26, look at verse 1. Notice what it says. Then all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in the room of his father Amaziah. And then it goes on to tell what, uh, what he built there, restored it to Judah, verse 2. And after that, the, the king slept with his father. In other words, he died. Verse 3, 16 years old was Uzziah when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 2 years in Jerusalem. And uh, his mother's name also was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. Notice what it says, And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father Amaziah, and you'd have to go back and look uh, in chapters, you know, uh, before 26 there and read about Amaziah, his father, uh, again. Um, and I'm going to uh, talk about that in just a second. Now, he took the throne at age 16 and he reigned 52 years. Again, he was a good king for the most of the time. And he enjoyed God's blessing. Look at verse 4 and 5. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all of his father. Uh, verse 5. And he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. You see, uh, you see, that's how the Old Testament, when you look at uh, the people there and what they did is God, their uh, system was set up where is if they obeyed God, God blessed them. If they disobeyed, guess what? He sent uh, punishment and disaster to them. In other words, the crops died, everything. He sent these all kinds of these dreaded diseases. See, Israel did not have diseases. Uh, they got all the disease they had from Egypt, 
And so, uh, and so you see, uh, when it, it followed them out, and when God, you see several times how that God used some of these uh, different diseases, uh, he put them upon them. And so, again, he took the throne. Now, here's the thing about Uzziah. He was a good king. Again, think about this. He was 16 years old. And so, uh, again, he probably co-reigned with his father there for a few years because if we had the time, I could show you how that, you know, so many years it talked about his father and him. And so he co-reigned there when he was 16. He, uh, he, he kind of took over, but his father was, in, you know, in the shadows. But as what took place with him is part of the way into his reign, he'd been reigning, I guess, about 25 years or so, give or take, is what he had is he began to take God for granted. And so he, uh, it said that we read the verse about Zechariah. As long as Zechariah was the priest, see, he kept him straight. And as long as Israel had a strong uh, priest and a godly priest, guess what? The nation prospered when the kings allowed these priests to do what God had put them there to do. But as what had happened is, God, uh, uh, somebody, one of the uh, nations defeated part of what he was trying to do. And as what happened is he, he got anxious with the priest. And he says, I think I'll just go into the, uh, the uh, Holy of Holies in those places and offer this sacrifice myself. Well, as he was about to go in, all of a sudden he got leprosy. And it came upon him. And he was a leper until the day he died. And he was put in a separate house uh, uh, as a result of that. And so, um, let's see what we got here. Look at verse 16. Notice what it says. But when he was strong... In other words, if you look at verse 15, look at it, it says, He made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men to be on the towers and upon the bulwarks to shoot hours and great stones. In other words, He made these contraptions where these, these things could shoot these stones X amount of, you know, hundreds of feet out there uh, and, and kind of keep the, uh, the enemy back a little bit. With the, and He could shoot these arrows, kind of like what we have today with the tanks. You know, and stuff like that. I remember when I first, you know, I know they're more powerful today, man. There's, you know, compared, I retired out of the Army in 95. And so a lot of the weapons have changed since then. And, uh, but I know that when I was in Germany, when I got first got there in 83, uh, uh, we had the uh, 8 inch how what they call howitzers. And those were the big tanks back then that they could shoot 23 miles on a dime. I mean, those things were pretty accurate up to that, that amount. Now they got them for hundreds of miles and stuff like that. And they can, you know, with nuclear heads and everything else, they can just destroy all kind of stuff they want to. But that's what kind of stuff he did there and had these men uh, uh, prepare those things uh, uh, to shoot arrows and great stones. And his name spread far abroad, for he was marvelously helped Till he was strong. Now notice what it said. Notice in comparison, verse 16. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up um, up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And Azariah the priest went in after him, and with his uh, fourscore priests, and there was 80 priests right there, of the Lord that were valiant men. And they withstood Uzziah the king and said unto him, It appertaineth unto thee, uh, Uzziah, to burn incense in the Lord, but to the priests, the sons of Aaron. See, those are the only ones that would be the high priest. God designated that. Aaron was the first high priest. Uh, for thou hast transgressed, neither shall it be for thine honor. Then Uzziah was wroth and had a censer in his hand to burn. And while he was wroth with the priest, the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priest. From beside the incense, and Azariah and all the priests looked upon him, and behold, he was leprous in the forehead, and they thrust him out. Verse 21, And Uzziah the king was a leper until the day of his death, and dwelt in a several house. Several is an old English word, just meaning uh, single or separate. Okay?
being a leper, used two other times in Matthew 25, you'll see, or Matthew 15, I believe, and then also you'll see in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 when it's talk, talking about the gifts, or he uses the word several, meaning individual. Uh, was cut off from the house of the Lord, and Jotham, his son, was over the king's house judging the people. Now, as what we see here again, remember that Isaiah is writing this uh, during the time of these kings. And so as long as God blessed him, we see uh, uh, until then, you see the Bible says in Proverbs 16, 18, most of us know this, that pride goeth before what? And a haughty spirit what? Before a fall. Destruction and a fall. And so is what you see, that's, that's exactly, that's a, a living example there. In other words, you see uh, anytime you want to, you can look sometime. I've never tried it, but I, you know, I've read and I've, I've did it a, a little bit, not too much. But there's about uh, 3,000 Proverbs, give or take, there in the book of Proverbs in 31 chapters uh, that Solomon wrote, basically. And you can take each one of those Proverbs and you can go through the Bible and match each one of those up to an individual. It's hard, and some of them may take more than one, but again, you see a living example, and that's what you see here in this man about pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And so, again, uh, uh, we see this, and that's what took place during his reign. Again, this thing of pride, we can do what, we got this massive army, we got this, we can, we can take this, we can, and God says, no, you won't. <laughs> and so uh, we see that it didn't take place. Again, the same way, look at our uh, nation. In other words, it's lifted up in pride even now, thinking that, you know, uh, we got this massive army, we got this or that, you know, not realizing that it's the almighty dollar out there that uh, could claim America overnight and put it on its knees. If China and all these people recalled all the debts that America owes them, they could be under the ground by uh, tomorrow morning. In other words, that's how strong, in other words, pride, you know, goes in. And so, again, uh, that's the first king there. In other words, 52 years. Now, his son, uh, notice there in uh, in uh, Second Chronicles chapter 27, we're going to talk about Jotham. All right. Uh, verse 1, Jotham was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 16 years, and his mother's name was uh, uh, Jer Jerushabab, the, the daughter of Zadok. Zadok was one of the priests. And so, again, you had a godly mother, and so notice what it says about him. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Now, notice how far he went. Only according to all that his father Uzziah did. So in other words, his father was, you know, to a certain extent, a good mentor because he took over and he did that which was right uh, for uh, at that far. But notice what, what he didn't do. However, albeit, he did entered not into the tem temple of the Lord. In other words, God makes a point to put that in the scriptures there for us to see. In other words, his father did this, went in the temple and became leprous until he died. And he made sure, you know, it said he didn't do that. In other words, so he went as far as what his father did was good. He did that, except he didn't go in the temple. Notice what it says. And the people, now notice what the people did. The people did yet corruptly. In other words, they had a king, Uzziah, who was pretty strong, had a pretty good priest, and he did pretty good until he you know, got lifted up. But here, this guy, was he was kind of like a weakling in a way. Because he was a king, but yet the people did what they wanted to do. Uh, they weren't godly. Uh, and again, uh, again, just look at today. All the stuff that's going on, but yet there's a, there's a church on just about every street corner. In other words, uh, do you see any bars closing down? Do you see any, you know, any, of these, uh, any uh, of these bills getting passed, you know, repelling all this stuff about homosexuality and things like that? You don't see that. Why? Because th there's a form of God, but denying the what? The power. You see, uh, again, thereof. And so, again, took the uh, thing. But notice what he says. He built the high gate of the house of the Lord. The high gate. 
and on the wall he built much. Moreover, he built cities in the mountains. Verse 5, he fought against these kings of the Ammonites, prevailed against them, and the children of Amnon uh, gave him the same year a hundred talents. In other words, uh, they became vassals or servants uh, as a result of that. So much did the children of Ammon pay unto him, both the second year and the third. Now notice what it says. So Jotham became mighty. Why? Because... He prepared his ways before who? The Lord his God. And so, again, he slept with his fathers. And see, he was buried in the city of David. In other words, he was buried with royalty. Whereas his father did all that stuff, he wasn't buried. He was buried outside the city because he was a leper. Those, those guys, you know, they were taboo when it comes to leprosy back in the old days. Uh, again, uh, they had to stand at least 100 feet away, holler, unclean, unclean, as long as, you know, they were about. You see that in the New Testament. Remember the ten lepers are clean. Uh, nine went on their way, uh, went on shopping down at Walmart, and the other one came back and gave thanks, right? What happened to them? Jotham. Again, I, you know, I thought, in other words, he was a good king in worship, you know, God bless him. And here's the thing, though he was a good king, the people lived corruptly and did not obey God. You see, his influence was not that strong. And uh, again, he continued to worship idols. Uh, hold your place in Second Chronicles and turn back to Second Kings, chapter 15. You know, it was interesting, I thought, as I was looking at Jotham's life, uh, He's in the genealogy of Jesus. <laughs> you go back to Je uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 9, you'll see his genealogy there. And I thought that was interesting. You know, there's not a lot of people, you know, you think about, you know, with, with the amount of people in there, there's not that many people. There's four women. And you find Jotham there, uh, in there. And all those women, you know, were uh, dregs of the world as far as the world was concerned. But they, they became important you know, because of their godliness and things like that. Second uh, Kings chapter 15. Look at verse 35. Well, let's back up to uh, 33. Well, look at 32. In the second year of Pekah, the son of, of Amalia, king of Israel. In other words, there's the ten tribes. Begat Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, to reign. Five and twenty uh, years old was he when he began to reign. He reigned sixteen years. And his mother's name was Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. He did according to all that his father Uzziah had done. Almost sounds the same. But notice what it says. Howbeit, the high places were not removed. The people sacrificed and burned incense still in the high place. He built the higher gate of the house of the Lord. Back to Second Chronicles. So you see, again, he did not take and do exactly what he should have done. And so you don't see him, he's kind of weak-kneed, so to speak, uh, because he did not uh, make these people, they weren't, you know, they just followed after the other gods. It's just kind of like him just sitting up there and saying, hey, you need to go to Sunday school this week. You know, and he might have went or he might not have went, but uh, everybody else says, oh, you do your thing, we'll do our thing. That's kind of like if you read, I mean, if you look, and see and come try to compare that's about what they, he was doing, in other words. And so, um, again, we see that. Um, now, during his reign in Judah, uh, uh, tiglath Pelzer, king of Assyria, took the northern part of Israel captive. Again, back in Second Kings uh, 15, 29, we won't take time to go back there. Uh, but it talks about this. Again, this was the beginning of the end for the northern tribes. That's what took place because that's when uh, they, were, they were fixing to go downhill fast uh, a after this thing about uh, with Assyria because we know that Assyria would come in uh, 223 or so, uh, I mean 723, and uh, completely disrupt everything. everything. The third king there, notice what it says. Uh, the third one was named Ahaz. Uh, on your paper, I got Ahaz there. In other words, uh, uh, look in chapter 28 of Second Chronicles. Ahaz, verse 1. 
was 20 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, but he did not. That was right in the sight of the Lord like David his father. For he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. This is what happened to Israel. We're talking about the ten tribes now when it says Israel. And made also molten images for Balaam. Moreover, in addition to that, he burnt incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom and burnt his children in the fire after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. He sacrificed also and burnt incense in the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. And uh, again, so you see what, uh, I, I've never, I don't understand this uh, when you read about this guy Jotham because Uzziah was a good king and it, and it mentioned his mother. And then Jotham was, you know, he watched, he did the same thing as his father did that as far as, you know, doing some of the good stuff but he didn't enter the temple. But then all of a sudden you see this guy's son come out a real knothead when you look at what, how the Bible describes him. In other words, all of a sudden he brought, see before his father didn't get rid of the stuff on the walls up there. In other words, he still had the, uh, those images and things like that on the wall, but he didn't offer his sons to that, that idol uh, there. In other words, the ones that we've talked about before where they would heat up. And then, you know, put the baby alive. Uh, uh, and here's the thing about it. Uh, if the, if the, the king or anybody refused to do that, they killed the kid anyway. And so, you know, they made it really, really bad when they did that. And, and see, here's what's bad about Jotham. And the thing I didn't know, he didn't just do his first son. He did his second. And he did many more sons. <laughs> it wasn't just one. And so uh, you see him, uh, you know, doing all this stuff. And so, uh, because of this idolatry, God caused him to be defeated by the king of Syria. In chapter 28, look at verse 25 in, in Second Chronicles. And in every several city, there's that word again, another single or particular he made high places to burn incense unto other gods and provoked to anger the Lord God of his uh, fathers. And so, again, this, this wickedness. And so, here's what, what, what took place. Now, I want you to see this. Look in uh, chapter 28 again. Because he was uh, defeated. We just read that by this king. Now, look at verse 6. Or verse 5, it says, Wherefore the Lord his God delivered him into the hand of the king of Syria. And they smote him and carried away a great multitude of them captive and brought them to Damascus. Uh, again, Damascus was the capital. If you look on the map I gave you last week, that's the capital there of uh, Samaria. And you'll see it uh, up there. But notice, and he also delivered him into the hand of the king of Israel who smote him with a great slaughter. Look at verse 6. For Pekah, the son of Romalia, slew in Judah 120,000. How long did it take him? One day. In other words, you want to you do this, you, you make God mad, you know, and, and things. Look at verse 7. And Zichri, a mighty man of Ephraim, slew Manasseh, the king's son, and Azarkam, Arizakam, the governor of the house, and Elkanah that was next to the kings. In other words, his high up people he slew. Verse 8. And the children of Israel carried away captive of their brethren. These are their brothers. In other words, the ten tribes is carried away the two tribes. In other words, they're brothers. They're doing this to each other. 200,000 women, sons, and daughters and took away much spoil from them and brought the spoil to Samaria. You say, why is that? Why did God allow that? Because of what he did. Because, in other words... Of, of, of this sacrifice and these things like that, bringing this back. See, God, that's why he, uh, when, when God sent Moses into there and then Joshua went into the promised land, he was rooting all those people out as a result of what they worshiped and what they did for years past. And so he was having them killed. He would tell Joshua, go in there and kill everybody. Don't leave uh, nothing alive. Animal, kid, child, nothing. Kill them all. Especially when you got to Ai, in other words, and, and to Jericho and those places. He, he slew them. 
All of them. You say, why did God do that? It's because God had given them mercy and stuff like that for hundreds of years to get right, and they never did. And so when God made that promise to Abraham, guess what? He told uh, the people, again, I'm booting them out. They're going to be rooted out so that you can go in and have lands and houses that you didn't build and, and vines that you didn't plant and do all this stuff. In other words, the blessing of God was going to fall, whereas the Canaanites, the uh, the Hittites and all those other ites out there, God wanted them out. But see, now he's allowing this guy to come down and do all these things, these kings of Samaria and, uh, and of uh, Ephraim there. And so we see what kind of stuff is going on. Look in verse, uh, I thought this was interesting. Chapter uh, 28 again, verse 24. And Ahaz uh, gathered together the vessels of the house of God and cut in pieces the vessels of the house of God and shut up the doors of the house of the Lord. You see that? Seems like that just happened not too long ago. You see a parallelism? (laughs) In other words... And a lot of it, we know, you know, the stuff that went on and all that and why the doors were shut. But I'm saying, that's the kind of, in other words, he completely said, hey, we don't need this, this house of God. This stuff is bringing too much bad luck on us. People are, you know, dying and all this, 120,000. That's a lot of people. That's more than the city of Temple. That's, that's about the city of Colleen, give or take a few. You know, gone. In other words, he took all the silver and gold from the temple and hired the king of Assyria to attack, attack uh, Syria. Well, guess what? The king of Syria took his money, but then didn't want to back, <laughs> back him up. And so, again, you see what's taking place. The idolatry spread. Look at verse 25. And in every several city of Judah he made high places and provoked God the anger of his fathers. And so you see, again, from a, a fairly decent king to a you know, fairly decent king, now this guy is rotten to the core. The next one, Hezekiah. And we've got a few, couple seconds. I'll try to, again, we're going to study him later on because he, he has a special place in, in the book of Isaiah. And again, um, let's see, chapter... Chapter 29, verse 1. So all these are in a row. Hezekiah began to reign when he was five and twenty. And he reigned nine and twenty years in Jerusalem. And his uh, mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that David, his father, had done. We don't have time this morning, but uh, again, is what this was him and Josiah. Uh, on down the road are the only two good kings that are left by the time they're they're destroyed by Babylon in 586. And we see that Hezekiah completely just rearranged everything. He got rid of the wicked people. He got rid of all the idols. He got rid of everything. And, uh, I mean, he began to do some house cleaning from the top all the way down. And then he called on people to repent and and, and a great revival spread. And we know what took, you know, and we'll look at more of it uh, next Sunday. But again, again, he was one of Israel's best kings following in the uh, footsteps of David. He had the people in a spiritual revival and resulted in the kingdom continuing for about another 120 years as a result of his godliness. Again, it, stay, it stayed that 120. And after that 120 years, when you start seeing Zedekiah and Jeconiah and, uh, and all those kings, the very last kings being carried away and stuff like that. I mean, it got so bad at the very end when they took that one king, Zedekiah, and they took him down there to Babylon, and they, they gathered all of his sons, and right in front of him, they killed every one of them, right? So they could, he could see that, and then they put his eyes out. And so that's in his mind for the rest of his life. That's the last sight he saw. And that's the kind of stuff, you know, the sin, you know, taking place as a result, uh, you know, of, of this sin. And again, like I say, uh, it, it's heading this way even faster than what we think it is. 
um, he reestablished the worship of God, you know, through song and music. Uh, chapter 29, verse 30, you see the, the songs and the music. Moreover, Hezekiah the king and the princes commanded the Levites to sing. Remember what David did when he got, when he got those uh, people together and to sing and, and when they dedicated the temple. And Solomon did the same thing, 2 Kings 1 through 3 uh, or through 6 over there, or 1 Kings. He led the nation to keep the Passover after they neglected it. You can read that in chapter 30 there, 1 through uh, 27. And again, here we see God's mercy. There was great joy instructed the people. In other words, as a result of Hezekiah's faithfulness, God blessed him. He was able to defeat the Assyrians and the Philistines. And we know what took place because uh, the Assyrians out there, they, they come up and started, you know, uh, just deriding him more or less and say, ah, oh, you can't defeat this, you can't do this. Just go ahead and give in and this and this and that. And so Hezekiah, they sent a letter uh, to him to read. And it said to Hezekiah, we'll get to it later, but in chapters uh, 37 to 39 in Isaiah, you'll see it also about Hezekiah there uh, in 36 uh, over there, how that he spread that letter. He got on his knees and face before God and spread that letter out and said, God, in other words, is it easy or is it hard? He said, you're a God that you can do any of this stuff. And it said, and God told him, don't worry about it. And he woke up the next morning, there's 185,000 Syrians laying dead power of prayer you see that's what it takes and that's again that's what that's what we need and again uh, not just the veneer there and again we'll talk more about this next week but next week I want to uh, start in and I want to show you uh, some of these things we're going to talk about the prophecies and the things that's going on there in the book of Isaiah and how uh, again this is a glorious book really and I wish I had a lot of time just to spend on some of this stuff and talk about God because that's what it's all about in Jesus all through this whole book. And so, again, we want to talk about that next week and, and how, again, uh, chapter 6, you know, of Isaiah, it says, you know, it says how that in the day that King Uzziah died, how that, you know, that uh, I lift, you know, I lifted up my eyes, you know, and it talked about the Lord. And Isaiah sees a lot of stuff. I mean, he sees uh, uh, the, uh, all the way, man, the entire future of Israel. You're going to see, again, uh, the entire thing about the devil. And we'll look at that uh, because it's laid out in, through his vision when he started talking about the devil and where he came from, you know, what, what's going on there. And so Isaiah is a fantastic book, and it and kind of gets us ready and our hearts ready, you know, that, that the Lord can come back at any time. And I guess if, if we really and truly honestly believe that, our lives will change. If we honestly believe, we say we do. And I say, you know, you know, glory to God and this and this and that. But I guarantee you our lives would significantly change and Copper's Cove would see something like it never seen before if just this church, even alone this church, not, nevertheless all the rest of the churches out there preaching the gospel, really, really and truly believe that Jesus was could come back today. And so let's think about that study and uh, and look at these things. We'll be back next week. Lord, bless the, the word of God to these people's hearts. And Lord, uh, it's been a blessing to me. Lord, I pray that you might strengthen us in the days to come. In Jesus' name, amen.